All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone here today. I'm Zach Frieders. I'm the executive director of the Global Learning Hub at UC Davis, and I'm really happy to have you join uh, the session today. Um, so my talk is on the ways that we uh, think about fostering student resiliency on our programs at UC Davis, our faculty-led programs. And this is actually a version of a presentation that I gave recently at the Forum Institute on Health and Safety. So if any of you were there, this will look familiar to you. Um, I want to underscore that a lot of what I'll talk about is uh, programmatic experimentation, so not policies or risk uh, management practices per se. Um, what we're doing at UC Davis is looking to develop best practices in the changing landscape of student resiliency, which I know all of you are thinking about as, as well. Some of our, our ideas work, some of them not so much, um, and I'm sure you all have great practices in this space, so I may try to end early to make sure that I can hear from you as well. And I want to underscore that I'm not our unit's risk manager, so if any of you do have that role, pl uh, please feel free to add uh, any comments in the chat, correct me, or weigh in uh, at the end if we have time. So I'll talk about um, two core aspects of our work. The first topic is how we foster resiliency through our work with uh, faculty, primarily through the training programs that we provide for them. And the second is how we encourage students and families uh, to do sort of a self-assessment of risk tolerance um, as an important aspect of their, their decision to study abroad. Um, and through this honest assessment, hopefully build some resiliency or at least manage expectations better. I have a few specific examples I'll share, and then I'll leave uh, leave you with some provocative questions about work in this space. And I say provocative only because I think we're all grappling with how to manage um, these issues um, and, and build student resiliency. So before I get started, though, I thought it'd be helpful to provide some context of our programming at UC Davis if you're not familiar with what we do. First and foremost, um, our engagement with all students uh, in global affairs is heavily based on our global learning um, and our global education for all campus-wide initiative. And this is a pretty self-explanatory initiative. It's aspirational um, for us to engage all students, undergrad, uh, graduate, professional, domestic and international students in global learning at their time at UC Davis. Um, and I raise this um, because we have a suite of intercultural activity, um, expanding set of pre-departure programming that we do, post-program um, wraparound uh, programming. And, um, and a focus on, on global learning that, um, that connects with students for their start at UC Davis. So what kind of skills and capacities they bring with them uh, to, to UC Davis um, um, already. And so central to this work, we believe that the student development needs to be holistic. Um, and we work hard to promote student resiliency as an expected component of intercultural learning um, and leadership and something that we expect students to acknowledge, think about and develop on their programs. And we know, um, everyone in this room, that intercultural learning and living in other parts of the world involve what we sometimes call hard learning um, and really difficult situations. And it's only fair that we're transparent about that hard learning with our students and families. And I think, yeah, I can at least say at UC Davis, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we, we sort of avoided those, those conversations and, and downplayed that, you know, at times study abroad was difficult and hard. Um, and so we build systems to support our students through these difficult um, situations, and um, and I'm proud of the work that we that we do, and I'll share some of this here. But we know we've got a long way uh, to go. So at the bottom of this slide here, you see a snapshot of the work that we do in study abroad. About three quarters of our students participate on our faculty-led programs. We've got about 40 or so in any given year, and 25% through uh, UCEAP, and a very small handful through independent programs. Um, because our study abroad programming is so heavily organized around faculty-led programming, we acknowledge that the faculty themselves are key to building student resiliency. For better or worse, they represent the conduit uh, to most of the connections that students have with services back uh, on our campus here at UC Davis. And where our faculty can't connect students with those resources, which I think is the ideal way to support students, we know that faculty themselves have to provide some degree of support on an emergency basis. So we know it's critical to train them. And I wanna note here that uh, what we hear from faculty is often that the ways they engage and support students abroad is very different from how they do on campus. And that's that itself is not a surprise, but what's interesting is that they mentioned that the, the key trainings that's required of all faculty on campus um, 
doesn't really prepare them for what they experience abroad. So there's a gap there. And that's what we feel our job is to, is to, to fill that gap and provide trainings that speak to specific needs abroad or, um, or translate some of what they might uh, see in trainings on campus to the abroad context. Um, one approach our faculty found really successful is to focus on building what we call a community of peers among the student cohort that really centers the students themselves in risk management to talk honestly about their expectation and their tolerances for risk or lack thereof, and to build some sort of local resiliency uh, through and within uh, the group. And an important aspect of this community of peers concept is integrating with the local staff uh, partners um, and, and the like that we have on the ground. And I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, so here's a couple of examples of the trainings that we do with faculty to support the whole student. Um, you know, risk management, um, uh, crisis response, academic issues obviously are, are critically important, but we also know that a lot of the resiliency issues that we deal with have to do with, with aspects of the whole student that maybe aren't at the fore of study abroad programming. And so we include things, um, you know, sexuality, safer sex, mental health, first aid, how to be a bystander, working with distressed and distressing students, um, more detail on student accommodations, which might look different abroad, having our faculty do tabletop exercises to work through scenarios. Um, again, the net result is that we're able to prepare faculty to support the whole student, not just the students that they have in the classroom, because we know that they're sort of a proxy for all the services that students are going to expect to connect with back at campus. So I mentioned earlier this community of peers approach, and um, and this is a, an experiment that we put in place during our uh, return from COVID, where we asked our faculty to work with students to really have an honest conversation at the start of the uh, of the program that effectively became sort of a social contract. What did students expect from the program? What did they expect in terms of the support from faculty and from campus? Focusing on expectations, recognizing that we may not be able to provide everything they expect, but managing expectations is important. Um, an important part of this conversation is to really talk about what students' risk concerns were. We could potentially address them in these meetings, um, potentially respond to them if it wasn't built into the program, or talk about ways in which the, those perceptions might be an appropriate and expected part of the study abroad uh, experiences. Um, and it also creates you know, a network. It, it attempts to recreate a community that students might expect to have on campus that, that doesn't create itself unless you put effort into it abroad. And so having a sort of a sense of bystander uh, support from, from our students and also in emphasizing that there's aspects of risk, certainly, um, but also support for students that requires them to work collaboratively, um, to, to think about supporting each other, to helping to learn through things. People are gonna have good times and bad times on the program and that they're there for, for, uh, for each other. Um, one point I do want to mention is that working with partners is really important uh, in this, um, whether it's academic institution, provider organizations, local contacts, um, to make sure that they have the same philosophical approach to student support that we do here at, at UC Davis, that they understand who our students are the types of expectations they bring with them, whether they're justified or not, um, and, and how to respond to them and recognizing that there's gonna be a cultural conflict between what our students bring with them in terms of risk perception and what's appropriate or expected on site. And a lot of the times this, this does have to do with cultural conflict that we wanna help students navigate through. Um, and then we wanna be mindful and I think this is where this community of peers is useful, especially where our faculty and our partners are involved. We want to be mindful of, about these issues of community fair trade, um, our engagement with local um, uh, partners. You know, we're sending a cohort of students, at least in the case of UC Davis, 20 to 30 students into local communities. And that creates a set of expectations, some conflicts, some expectations, I mean, from the students that aren't realistic about what the the local staff or partners can provide um, that may 
appear to be risk elements, but in fact are not. It's just that they're not integrated with that, that community. Um, and so we definitely and absolutely want to include local staff and community members in these conversations um, and have deep conversations around cultural norms, practices, what types of supports are available to students, um, and really address some of these, these risk perceptions uh, head on. Um, I talked earlier about one of our approaches being to attempt to build student resiliency through our work with families. Um, Pre-COVID, one um, experiment that we launched and we've continued since then is to do a, a, a pre-enrollment a pre uh, parent and family webinar on, um, on uh, health safety and a lot of other issues around study abroad fees and those sorts of things. But the health and safety part of it actually ended up being one of the more um, poignant parts of those conversations. And what we do is we talk really honestly about the role that families have in decision-making, the perception of risk, that individuals and families themselves are gonna have varying degrees of risk tolerance. And that's okay, that's totally fine. People bring that with them to the decision to study abroad, <clears throat> excuse me, and in the programs themselves, and we want to have an honest conversation around is, you know, first and foremost, study abroad right for your level of risk tolerance? Uh, is a particular location right for your, your level of risk tolerance? Um, and, and crafting decisions around that so that students feel a little bit more comfortable about what they are um, okay managing through and what, and what they absolutely uh, are not and to help them handle what we know will be stressful situations. Um, going forward. And we spend some time talking about how the perceptions of risk abroad may be, might be elevated compared to very similar risk profiles here on campus or in the United States and to help them kind of navigate, you know, whether the, the sense of the unknown being in a different location is actually more risky. In many cases, it's not. Um, and to compare that to similar situations that they would expect here on campus. And then really emphasizing again that the reason we do this is because we expect students, again, through this community of peers and other activities that we do, we expect them to be part of risk management on site, to look out for each other, to make safe decisions, to not go beyond their own risk tolerance um, and get into situations that may not be threatening or dangerous objectively, but could feel that way for them. And so there's this shared approach to risk management we want them to, uh, to uh, acknowledge. One way that we do this um, is through, again, I keep talking about plain language, but we felt this to be really useful. We've got reams of contract language, reams of policy that I think because of the language can feel really threatening. Um, and so we work hard to include plain language in our agreements and our risk advisories. Um, we have a one page cover on our student agreement that's a plain language contract that really says, here's some of the things that we're asking you to think about when you sign this contract. Um, and to, to really take it seriously to the extent that it relates to whether or not you're gonna feel comfortable on this program. And we want you to understand what we, what we can provide for you and what we, what we can and what we expect of you. And we feel like one way that's important to do this is to be very transparent about our risk advisories for study abroad generally. And we have a statement for this and I've excerpted some of it on the, the right-hand side of the slide here. And we have program specific um, um, risk advisories. And a lot of these document, a lot of the language in this document include the, the common things that you would expect. But what I've excerpted here are some things that maybe may not be objectively more risky issues, but could, could create situations where students are uncomfortable or where it might exceed risk tolerance for some. Um, talking about some physical expectations of travel, um, uh, climate <laughs> expectations, living in different types of housing that don't have the same amenities that students would come to expect on the UC campus. Um, that certain forms of transportation are traditional and common and might be the only form of transportation, but they're not governed by uh, by policy or, or governmental oversight in the way that they are here in the US. We don't get a lot of pushback from these. Sometimes we get questions around, you know, is there something to be concerned with here? And again, oftentimes there's not, but we want students to have a really holistic view and to think through some of the things that we know are most likely to create this sense of anxiety um, 
on campus and to share this with their with their families um, as they make the decision uh, to study abroad. And again, we're getting back to the sense that we want to address the whole student, the parts of the student outside of the classroom where these these activities or these interactions um, might have might present a challenge for for them. So as we wrap up here, I wanted to leave with a few final thoughts. Um, and it's a bit provocative. And for those of you who are risk managers, you know, please forgive me here, but I'm trying to, our unit is trying to, when we think about these things, is, is, is a particular issue a risk management issue or is it a communication, student perception, student expectation issue? And it's been helpful for us to think of that that dichotomy when we look at what we want to provide for supports for our students. So if we want students to become more resilient, we know we're going to put them into situations that stretch them, that ask them to do hard things. And no one likes to do hard things, but that doesn't mean it's a risky issue objectively. It does, you know, present some risk emotional, social, um, you know, uh, accommodations perhaps, but but it's something that we need to accept that we want to support our students to get through, not to necessarily avoid or to manage out of a program. Um, it's really important, as I said, that we partner with organizations that share these views and can support that type of really um, supportive and, and holistic um, engagement with our students so that they can get through those difficult learning um, situations. One thing that you know really strikes me um, is that our approach to risk management, especially at UC, oftentimes is very much you know sort of this helicopter, U.S. centric institutional risk that you know when we perceive that there is a threat to our student, we you know medevac them out of that location immediately. Oftentimes at the request of the student or the parents, and that approach is very there's. Um, you know, there's there's certainly a privilege to that for us, our ability to pull students out of those situations. But I think it also cuts against this fair, fair trade or community engaged principle where we want to work with our local partners. We want to support our students. We want to really be careful of is an issue something that requires us to remove a student from a situation or is it an issue where it requires us to provide more support and more nuanced support to a student? And so not a really clear cut a set of answers here, but something that's in the back of our minds to not reflexively just pull a student out of out of a location. Um, and then again, this this the sense that the ideal role is that we're putting students in situations that stretch them, and doing so because we're engaged with the community, with faculty who feel that they're supported to do this, and recreating this sense of student networks that provide them additional support um, on site. So I'm going to stop there. I think we've got about um, a couple minutes. I don't know exactly where we are, but I'll stop there anyway. Um, to if there's any questions that folks have, uh, any comments, and certainly if there's anything that you all are are doing that you'd like to share in this space. Um, again, this this is these are some things that work for UC Davis. They're not um, universal best practices. So I'm really interested in hearing comments and questions from you all. Hi, Zach, I can ask a quick question. I was curious when you talked about the social contracts that students are coming up with together, is that something that's done during the pre-departure orientation, some of those pre-departure meetings? Is it on site? Is it something that's revisited throughout? How is, what does what the timeline of that look like? It's a really good question. So the, this is this is totally informal. Uh, I use contracts as as a descriptor. We're not actually doing uh, contracts, uh, written contracts, or having students sign anything. Um, again, in COVID, we felt this this was sort of a necessary thing because we knew that students were going to have varying degrees of comfort being around other students who they may or may not know if they're infected. If they are, you know, some were fine continuing to live in shared housing. Some wanted to be separate and we couldn't respond to everything. We had to we had to follow local guidance on response to COVID, which varied from country to country. And so we felt it was useful for students to talk about, you know, there's a policy in place, local health uh, policy. However, your, your comfort level may be very different. And we wanna try and accommodate that. We may not be able to, but let's have a conversation on that. Let's have an agreement with each other 
um, because we were anticipating, and in fact, it happened, you know, students saying, I think you're sick. I want you to go take a COVID test so that I can feel comfortable being around you. And we wanted to avoid that. And so we wanted to surface those concerns. Um, Organically, in the in the in the space of those conversations, they talked about a lot of other things: their comfort, you know, drinking or not drinking, partying or not partying. Um, really honest conversations around: do they feel comfortable in this location or not? Um, and and those provided really good opportunities for students to share with each other. Some might have had more experience in the location and could give some insight. And really what it came down to is like, okay, look, we've had this really honest conversation. You are a community of people. You rely on each other. You can look out for each other. This is a network that you can tap into when you are feeling uncomfortable, when you're feeling scared, when you're feeling just out of sorts. And and let's 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 come back to this. Let's circle back to this. And, and let's let's refer back to this conversation when there's some issues that maybe don't engage with our policy, but we have to address it, you know, differing views on on some of the topics that are coming up in classes. And so we we did that again this year, encouraged our faculty to do it. Uh, obviously, there was not the same focus on COVID, but um, but it was still productive conversations. Thank you. We are at time. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. I think this will get posted. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any other questions. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you all.